how do we raise confident kids in a changing and unpredictable world? That is the question we're going to answer today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Today, I have an amazing guest with me. Her name is Nellie Hardin. She's an author, speaker, and family life and leadership coach who focuses on helping parents love and lead their teens and tweens in a way that teaches them to love and lead themselves while building a strong foundation of worth, esteem, and confidence all before they leave home. Nellie is a wife, a mom to four teenage daughters. She's a retired homeschool parent and an adventure chaser. She has a background in biology and psychology from humpbacks to humans and years of personal, family, and faith leadership development. Welcome, Nellie. I am so thrilled to talk to you about this topic today on Flourishment. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So let's talk about why confidence became one of those things that you centered your message around. There's a lot of things that you have expertise in, as we've just discovered through listening to your bio, but tell us why confidence really has a place in your heart. Well, as a young woman myself, um, back in the day, (laughs) uh, I you know, I was raised in in a home, in a wonderful home. But when I left home to go to college, I was 17. I graduated early and and went off to college. And, you know, my parents did the best they could with what they had. But they also, I, I was really lacking that foundation of worth, esteem, and confidence. And we also, I did not grow up in a faith-led home. And neither did my husband either. And so it's really just miraculous. And that's a whole other podcast and story, how we can, uh, how we've gotten to the point that we are in now. But my point is when I did go off and I was seven hours away from home and away from any accountability or any sort of uh, wisdom that could speak into me, the only thing I knew to do was to chase my worth anywhere that I could find it. And as a young woman, especially that can get, uh, go down some really dark corridors. And within weeks, months, I was in some really bad places and there was some big consequences and it was just a really dark place to be. And it was service. It was community service that got me out of that. My second semester, I I quit going out. I quit seeing, you know, anyone and second semester service has always been such a big part of my heart. And second semester, my freshman year, I joined a service, a co-ed fraternity, Alpha Phi Omega. That's actually where I met my husband. And we were in the same pledge class. And it was such a beautiful turn of events. But I still then had so much baggage that I had to carry around. And over the last several decades, I've learned how to build that foundation as an adult of worth, esteem, and confidence, and let go of that, and really let God take the burden of that. But it was such a treacherous and long road to go on. So then come to, you know, come to life and find out now I'm raising four daughters and my daughters, we had four daughters in four years. And so that's a lot of daughters all in that time. Right. And that was after going through infertility for three years before that. And so the pendulum swung one way and then it really swung the other way, you know, super fast. And we almost lost my husband in 2012 uh, from a cardiac uh, condition that he had. And there was just this point of looking at my four daughters that were four, two, two, and newborn. I have twins in the middle. uh, In the hospital room, as we didn't know if my husband was going to make it, and just really looking at them and saying, okay, there, we only have a limited amount of time that we can be the primary impact of your life before you go off into the world and you are bombarded by this ever-changing world that changes. I mean, before I would say it was changing monthly. I would say now it's changing daily. And what can we do in order to set you up for success? Because I never wanted them or anyone else's daughters or children going off into the world just chasing worth. And so that's where really the foundation was set. And then esteem on top of that is value and appreciation of yourself. And then the the top rung of that foundation is confidence, which is actual belief in yourself. So if we can 
take what so many people learn as, you know, quote unquote, leadership training or anything later on in life, but instill it into our kids when they are young and their brains are forming and those tracks are forming in their frontal lobe, then we can really set them up with a foundation for the rest of their life. And so that's really, you know, it's my own personal experience. It's my experience as a mother. It's my professional experience, my faith experience that has all come together in order to do what I'm doing today. So let's break this down into steps that you can apply in different stages and ages for your kids. Would you say that you can begin this confidence, esteem, and worth building process even in the very youngest years? And what does that look like? Absolutely. So in parenting too, the first half of parent or first half of childhood is very different parenting than the second half of childhood. So in the first half of childhood, you are building life for them, right? You are telling them what they're going to eat, many times what they're going to wear, who their friends are, where they're going, all of the things. You are feeding life to them. It's a very parent-disciplined, uh, parent-led discipline time, which is great, and that's how they need to learn during that time. And then there's what I call the great transition, right around seven, eight, nine, ten. It depends. Every child is different, um, and it's it's a it's a gradual transition. It's not a flick of the switch, you know, a light switch. Um, but then you are doing life with them in order per, to prepare them to do life on their own, and. This transition is often missed, and then it is grieved by parents when they have the 14 and 15-year-olds, and they're like, why isn't my kid, you know, the cute, snuggly five-year-old anymore? And they're not supposed to be, and so we go through that transition. But when they're children, and younger children, first half of childhood, when we are teaching them life and we're giving them these uh, tools that we have... That's when we really need to show our patience. We need to ask their opinions, right? Uh, one of the great side effects of a very devastating situation we went through with my husband almost passing away, which by the way, he's here today and just doing just fine. Um, but, you know, I had a four-year-old and two two-year-olds at the time, and we had to have some really serious conversations during then. I really needed my four-year-old's help taking care of my three younger ones when we were in doctor's appointments or we were home and things like that. But our communication has always been stellar. And I think a big part of that is because I didn't treat her like a child child during that time. I treated her like a person growing up because we are not raising kids. We're raising adults, right? And of course, it was age appropriate what we were sharing and what we were having her do. But it was also... I need you. Do you think that you could help me? And it gives them that role and responsibility even then that their worth really starts to develop. And so there's five pillars of worth, and that is that they are seen and that they are heard and that they're loved and that they belong. They truly belong somewhere and that they have a purpose. And so even during that, I'm giving you, you know, I'm feeding you life stage in the first half of childhood, you can really start to develop those with things as small as when they walk into a room, you acknowledge that they walked into a room, you give them eye contact, you say their name, you smile at them, you ask their opinion, whether they want mac and cheese or, you know, whatever for dinner, right? And you just value their input so that they know that they are seen, heard, love, belong, and have a purpose. And then when you get into the second half of childhood, they already have an inkling of that, but now it's even more during the second half of childhood. Those are wonderful tips. And I love the way that you're describing this, that you're helping us raise really effective adults, kids that are going to be really confident and able to fulfill their purpose when they're adults without all that struggle that we sometimes experience with our esteem and our worth and our purpose. If parents are just starting this process in that second part of parenting where their kids are already beginning to individuate, as we say in psychology, mm -hmm. What would you recommend that they could still do? Because it still isn't too late, right? Oh, no, not at all. What I really recommend is vulnerability. 
honestly. And as people, as parents, we need to be able to show up to our kids in a vulnerable way. Why? Because we need to teach them how to be vulnerable also. And so it's not this tough as nails. I'm a perfectionist. I'm perfect. I, I expect you to be perfect mentality, right? As parents, one of the worst things we could do is try to be quote unquote perfect because then we're showing them you can never mess up. And if you do hide it, sweep it under the rug, forget about it, which we never forget, right? And and just keep marching on, right? It's the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps type mentality, which I get and appreciate. I, you know, had to mulch 25 yards of my yard in a rainstorm not too long ago, right? I get that sometimes. But at the same time, when it comes to real life, right? When it comes to learning how to live life, you need to be able to sit down and say, hey, listen, I've been noticing these few things. And I think part of what I'm noticing is because I haven't been able to show you that you are seen and I see you and I hear you and you are truly loved. You really do belong here, even though sometimes I might make you not feel that way. And you absolutely have a purpose. I mean, if you think about anything that our teens are facing today. And right now, my daughters are 18, uh, 15, 15, and 13. We have run the gamut. I mean, the things that my kids are sent over text, you know, the things that they're exposed to, you know, and we've homeschooled, we've done Christian school, we've done public school. It never fails to astound me, but also not astound me at the same time. And just the other day, uh, one of my daughters was uh, exposed to a friend of a friend, a 15-year-old that was having a child at home, and it was her third child, and she was having it in the bathtub at home, and she did pictures and and sent it all. And my 13-year-old was like, Mom, what do I do? And I was like, okay, first of all, we're going to pray for this person, right? We're going to pray for these babies, and then we're going to exit out of this because this is not something that you need to be exposed to. It's okay to know that it's happening, but you don't need to be exposed to this on a daily basis, right? Right. And so they know that it's there. We're not raising in a bubble, but we're also creating some resilience and understanding around that and a place to go in prayer and understanding and vulnerable conversation, right? And so that open communication is absolutely vital because I promise you these random crazy things are going to be in the sphere of your child's life no matter what you're doing, because we have access to everything in this world right now. And everybody feels like sharing everything, (laughs) you know, that's out there. And so that would be my first order is just to sit down and be really vulnerable and say, you know what, I want to make sure that you are seen, heard, love, belong, and, and you know that you have a purpose. Because when we think about what's out there, that's always the root of what our kids are struggling with right now. So vulnerability is the first step. So I can't wait to dive into this even more in the second half of our conversation. But for now, I do want you to be able to share how people can stay in touch with you and get a copy of your brand new book. Absolutely. So I like to keep things simple because uh, Lord knows the world's complicated enough. So everything can be found on my website, which is just NellieHarden.com and all of our communities, the book, um, there's uh, resources there that you can download. All of that is available right on my website, NellieHarden.com. I hope that all of you listening will access these resources for the best potential that your kids can have in their lives. And of course, I hope that you hit subscribe to this podcast and come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be found on the Edify app.